Audio test one, two.
It's 9 o'clock. Let's go and get our site committee started here. I'd like to welcome everybody. First item on the agenda is a custodial contract discussion and plan by Hal Taylor. So I'll start first. Uh, just to bring the food. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to be jumping again. Now. But just to uh, bring everybody up to speed, um, a few years back, you know, we went under contract with SMS. Um, you know, Steve Morgan was part was the chair of the site committee at that point in time, and uh, SMS was later uh, bought out by HES, and now that company is called HES. And uh, we've had a fairly good relationship with the company, uh, with the officials that run the company, and and the folks that are working inside of our schools and our buildings. Um, but you know, we do feel there's need for improvement. We do feel that. Uh, we uh, aren't at all times getting all the services that we are are needing in our schools, and especially in the environment where we are today. And, and COVID has brought a lot of things to light for a lot of different reasons, uh, not just custodial, but a lot of different things we're looking at and doing. So, Hal and I have talked and have done um, 
quite a bit of homework. He's done a lot more homework on this than I have. So I'm about to hand over the reins to, to Hal to talk to you, the board, and be able to answer questions. But uh, we, we feel that where we are today, um, we, we might need to look at a change. We might need to look at a different way of handling our custodial services uh, in order to make sure that we're providing the best we can for you know, our students and our employees um, and, and our families in general. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Hal and let him uh, discuss this and be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Dyer. Um, well, as Dr. Dyer said, our, our, our teachers and our students and parents Everybody in the school system deserves a clean environment. And uh, without beating anybody up, I, I would rather concentrate on where we need to be than where we need to go. And where we need to go is to have a standard and, uh, to be able to hold somebody accountable. And that's, that's a hard thing when you, when you think about it initially and you say a standard. Um, you know, what we tried to do, we had an initial proposal. I brought it with me. This was the proposal we received. All of the proposals we received at the time were very similar. And this is about 60 page, and this is a typical 60 to 100 page proposal you get from a cleaning company. And what we try to do is put an RFP and we demand certain things be cleaned during the week you know the classrooms get certain things on a daily basis they get other things on a weekly basis other things on a monthly basis the, the problem is is keeping up with that knowing that it's actually getting done so trying to enforce that proposal and rfp becomes very difficult um one of the things that an organization has come up called the appa they came up with standards they are a trade organization uh, that came up with standards. And so one of the things we want to do is actually come up with a way to evaluate our facilities by looking at them and by their appearance so that we know whether we're getting, getting what we're paying for, basically, or what we're asking for. You know, we, we uh, contract with somebody, they say they're going to provide. We agree to pay that certain amount, but they don't necessarily provide us with what the standard we've asked for, you know. Um, so that's where um, what we want to start doing is looking at having a standard that's recognizable. That's where APA comes in. Uh, they have a standard that is a recognizable standard. Hospitals, for instance, would be a level one standard. Uh, you know, schools are generally a level two, and then you go down from there, you know, level three, four, and five. And what we want to do is, is hire somebody based on maintaining a level two standard. And that's where when you walk in, the floors are clean, the trash is taken out, the desks are wiped off. You have something that has a principle, you can walk into your school and you're able to see what this standard is and identify immediately whether that classroom or your offices or that little theater is up to that standard. And so that's one of the things that, that we want to try to provide this time around as a standard that says, you agree to keep it to this level and where it's gonna be really easy for us to see whether you're doing it or not. Instead of trying to dictate, you know, how many times do you clean the library a week? How many times do you actually vacuum the library you just spot clean, you know, so so that gets very tedious trying to demand that and then enforce it. So so that's the biggest thing I would like to come with you this time is is that we need to get our buildings up to an APA two standard and we need to keep it there. And I'll just say presently, if you have a chance to read that standard, you know, um, then I think you would probably walk around and you would be disappointed that we are not there at all with our schools. If anything, we are probably down at what's considered an APA four, um, you know, even beyond that in some of our facilities, just being honest with you. And again, I know that's not acceptable for you, 
that's not acceptable for our folks. And so that's why we are coming to you and we're going to ask you to uh, consider uh, canceling this contract with our present provider um, and us to look at an alternative. Um, One thing I, I would add in there, you know, when we're talking about APA standards and, and those kind of things, which is something fairly new that I've had to learn. <laughs> you know, this is not my field of expertise by any stretch of the imagination and all of these kind of things, but you know, you learn something new every day. And I've learned more about this over the last couple of weeks. Um, when it comes to the COVID type of things that we need to do to keep students safe, that's being maintained. We're making sure that that's done. You know, we're making sure that our rooms are sanitized, that we're making sure that bathrooms are you know, up to standard as far as those kind of things are concerned. So I'm not as concerned about the COVID type thing, but it's just your deep cleaning of carpets and all the other pieces that go into keeping our facilities the way we want them to be. I know I, one thing I learned quickly on this school board is that you all are, you know, buildings and our facilities are a source of pride. And that's one of the first things in the conversation that I remember when I first got here, I met with all the directors and when Hal and I talked, I shared, you know, one of the things that I really and big on is making the front of our buildings look good, our yard kind of look good. When you walk into our schools, you need to, need, to, need to notice them, that they're clean, because that builds a source of pride. And a source of pride in our community, because a lot of our community members never go in our schools, they drive by and they see on the outside. That needs to look nice, because that is a reflection of what happens on the inside, I think. Well, on the inside, we need to make sure we're taking care of business as well. Uh, we need to make sure that our teachers feel like they don't need to be the ones mopping their floors, you know, and uh, they don't need to be the ones uh, picking up trash in the corner and things like that. So that's something I want to work on and, and move us toward. And I know since I've been here, uh, we've had two clean companies, you know, one when I got here that we let go and then another one we brought in. We did due diligence. We did our homework. Had great recommendations and and everything, but for whatever reason, that just hasn't worked out well here. Now I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but that's just where we are. Uh, I, I I do think at this point we've had enough time, and Hal hasn't said this, but I'll say it. It has taken up a tremendous amount of his time <laughs> following up to make sure we're getting things accomplished to the point that we're having to. Uh, bring in some extra help outside of the custodial contract to make sure things are getting accomplished. And that's the point we, where we are. So, how anything else that you want to say? And then we'll find out what we're seeing down there. Any questions you have? We, we have done bidding in the past, and we were promised a lot of things the last time we did bidding. Um, and we could do bids again, but the last two bids that we've done have not really worked out really well because you're subject to taking the lowest bid, not necessarily the best fit for your school system. So the second part of this today is, is uh, we'll talk about any questions in a minute, but I also want to bring in the second part that I have. I'm, I'm bringing a, uh, a company in, SSC, that um, is a regional company that has a, a a good reputation. We've researched the references. Um, they have been vetted through a uh, purchasing system, uh, which is the TIPS program, which is a so so they're already approved by the state. We don't have to do a bid process with them. Um, we've had discussions about standards and levels of standards, uh, and. What we're looking at is what the going rate for the systems were three years ago. Um, you know, when you call around and you look at what pricing is. So I was going to ask you to also, first off, we'll have to, to talk a minute you know, more and have the discussion, but also consider uh, us having a discussion about moving forward with, with further discussion and consideration of SSC as well today so that we know 
more or less what we're getting, and we have some proven results to, to deal with. And of course, so, Matt Cooter is here. He's he's here to help with any questions you have. Um, you know, we sent a um, a summary of what they're proposing to us at this time, so we'll be glad to take any questions. And I think that's. And I'll, I'll just add one other thing. We did speak to Mr. Cable, our our attorney. And tips is a legal way that you can purchase things in a school system. It's a, it's a way of bidding out without having the school system bid out. It's a state bid, uh, for lack of a better term. And, and you've got information about that as well. So this has been vetted. It has been bid out. It's just not, we're, we're not locally bidding out this. It's, it's doing by order, basically, uh, for these kind of things. Uh, SSC does have a track record in Cleveland City Schools. They were here before Al and I were here. Yeah, they, were um, they, they did work here in the school system, uh, small accounts that we've been able to reference and uh, we felt to our, our chair here uh, for the site committee. Uh, good references in our school. I don't know exactly what happened there as far as the you know going to a new company and so forth at that point, but but uh, that's where we are. So we'll be glad to answer any questions at this point that you might have and uh, discuss this topic. So what we're basically asking permission to do, just a summary, is to, if the board agrees, and we'll have to just board, vote on this at our board meeting on Monday if it passes out of here, is to formally end our contract. We do have to give a 30 day formal notice to HES, which we would have more than enough time to do that because I think that ends June, June 1st, June 1st. So we want to make sure we, we get that correct um, and then get your blessings then to enter into final negotiation talks with SSC. Uh, that will give us time to do whatever we need to do as far as paperwork is concerned, have Mr. Cagle review the contract and hopefully bring it back to you for a, for a discussion of vote in April. So this is not something we have to get a new contract <coughs> on March 1st. I have a couple of questions. Some of us that have been on the school board for a little longer than some of the others have heard we've been through this process and we've been promised and you know we're going to move to new people right. in that are going to be supervisors and the buildings are going to be the cleanest they've ever been and, and uh, you know we've just been promised all of this this stuff so uh, you know the big question is who do you believe everybody has a good sales pitch so who do you believe one question I have is uh, when negotiating contracts, can you put this company on a probationary period? So, wait, how do you want to tackle that one? I, I, I think we can. There's, there is a, the, the only problem we have on something like that is we go year to year as this. If we do less than that, how do you replace them in the middle of the year? We had to do that one time. It gets the amount of equipment that you have to bring in, each company is responsible for their equipment. So moving that equipment out, bringing it in, having people change or even hiring new staff in a short amount of time is very difficult to make happen. So that's the only problem I can see with a probationary period. If you don't run it for at least a year from summer to summer, trying to make those kind of changes, uh, we had to uh, about nine years ago, eight years ago. Yeah. We had a company that just absolutely, and we ended up in several things. And that was very difficult, taking them out over a two week period of time in the middle of the year. And that contributed to other problems that continued on with us for a while. So, <coughs> so that's the only thing I would say about the program. I think we can do it, Matt. Is that something that you know, they've ever done before? Or? Well, it's a great question, and all of our contracts have termination clauses in them, so you could, you could terminate it based on whatever clause we negotiate. But essentially, in the K-12 market, they're all one-year deals anyway with options to renew. So that in, in itself is really probationary. Uh, but there is, like they said, a tremendous investment in equipment and labor to get an account started up, onboarding of all the individuals, getting the the schools to the proper standard so there is a tremendous investment there um, but to call it probationary we don't really do that but there is some renew it at the end of the first year if you want um, i suspect that 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 won't be an issue here um, 
just from some of the things that we were putting into place and and we based this deal off of not a specific RFP, but discussions with Dr. Dyer and certainly with Hal, like several hours of discussions with him. So with that explanation, is there uh, a price break for a multi-year uh, agreement? That's something we would have to talk about in our final negotiations. <laughs> they have discussed and given us what they feel they can do at this point. Um, and that's just for one year. That's that. Well, it's it's, it's actually, based on five years. It's based on five years. It's based on because they have to make an equipment investment. So as part of that summary, you will see that if they do leave before five years is up, we are basically assuming liability for the equipment. Um, best way for me to put it on, put put that out there. So and that's something similar to the like our child nutrition contract. Same thing. It's hard to make that kind of investment for one year and walk walk away from it. So. Uh, also investment in training and Tom can I approach where I think our biggest problem comes from um, the biggest problem I would say in that summary and in a presentation they gave us and that we will have provided for you is labor and what we constantly run into is everybody wants to hire part-time help <clears throat> right now I can tell you and I can I can tell you that I don't think my personal opinion from what I've been able to figure out I don't think that we have been fully staffed for the last three years the other piece of that is we probably have only 20 full-time employees on the janitorial staff okay that makes a huge difference with turnover and with people the quality of the employees you're getting and or through the service. I mean, it's their employees, but but the quality of employees, that makes a difference. And when they promise the service, they come in and say, oh, we have, all, we're, we have this great management. But what they're really saying is, we're going to be able to ballpark it because we're going to use part-time employees that don't get benefits. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to fill the staff up with that. And and then we're going to bring in people who are constantly changing over because they don't value their people enough. And that's one of the big discussions that we've had. You have to have some part-time employees, but one of the biggest difference that I can tell you between what they're proposing is, is the number of, uh, of uh, full-time employees they're proposing is dramatic. And that will make a difference. If you look at who we have that works in the school system that has stayed from company to company that does us a good job. And they're the superstars. We have some out there. They're the full-time employees that really care about their jobs. And we act, we have some, we have some really good ones, but unfortunately I, I do think that that's where we probably, it's a, it's a bottom line business decision. I think that's where we see it. I, I, I will answer that question. Well, are you going to be able to offer any benefits to them? Absolutely. Sir. So our parent company is Compass Group, which is the fifth largest employer in the world. Um, number one food and facilities company in the world in terms of size. And so we're able to offer a slew of benefits to our full-time employees. And just to mention, we're proposing to have 49 full-time associates and nine part-time associates. And those are to just plug holes in smaller schools where you can't have two full-timers at night, so you have to plug. It also gives us some flexibility to try to minimize some overtime. But in terms of benefits for our full-time people, uh, we've got health plans, which are the same health plans that I buy from, uh, gold, silver, bronze plans. We've got dental, vision. Each full-time associate gets a $10,000 life insurance policy that they don't pay for. They get uh, paid time off. Um, they have an opportunity to participate in our discount marketplace, which uh, things like um, uh, different stores offer discounts to be a part of this. Um, one easy example is like AT&T, you get a 20% off of your, uh, your phone bill, which is a big thing for associates. But all these things are designed for employee engagement. If employees are better engaged in their job, they're going to hang around longer and do a good job. So, with uh, the current uh, vendor that we're using, 
and those employees are local, right? Right. So will they be given consideration with this company first, uh, as long as they are you know, a good employee, so that they're not just lost? Absolutely. So there's always a learning curve when you start up a, an account. And the first thing they have to pass a background check. And we would come to, to the administrative team, to the building administrators, and talk to them about the associates that are currently working. And once we were given the, the nod, the award, we would set up a, a couple of onboarding meetings for these associates because they would be very scared. Oh, great, what, what's going to happen to me? We want to get in front of those employees quickly to let them know that there is an opportunity for them. And the first summer, we'll overhire anyway to make sure that we have enough staff and then gives us an opportunity to pick the very best. And uh, do training for all of those employees. <clears throat> Um, but that's that's the important piece is to get in front of them quickly. Yeah. And one thing I'll mention there is yesterday I did meet with principals. We had lunch yesterday and uh, Monday, excuse me. And we we discussed this operation that we're, we're talking about now. We discussed exactly what we're talking about. And one of the biggest things they told me is they want to talk. If we decide to go a different direction, they want to talk to you or your representatives because they have certain people in their school they definitely want. Back. So that Absolutely. was, and I told them that was something that we would do. So that's something that was important for me to pass along in the public meeting, so that you know, their voices are heard as far as that goes. But uh, but really, you know, the impetus for all of this change has been the feedback we've been getting from principals about what's what's going on in their buildings and not going on in their buildings. Um, and again, this is something that is it brought us to the. Already, uh, has there the company we've been using has have their services been below standard for the past three years or has it just been in this last year when everyone is experiencing so many problems with COVID? Um give me just a second to answer I want to answer that correctly without you have your uh, parent experience? Absolutely yes sir. As a parent um, I will say that um, my kids sat across the hall from a bathroom and quite frankly smelled it all day. Mm -hmm. So that I love it when I look at level two and it says washer room and shower fixtures and towel and gleam are odor free. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's important. Um, and so yeah, that's for the parent. I, I'll answer from my perspective and then how who deals with it much closer than I do. Um, I think it started off strong. I think the relationship started off strong and you know, we had a good start. Um, and then it, it didn't go as strong the rest of the contract. And I think the first year or so, we really did okay. But it, it, it's not where it was, and it's definitely not where it needs to be. And, you know, I don't have anything personally against the ownership of HES or anything else. It's just a business thing. Uh, but I, I do, um, I'm just not happy with the level of service that we're, we're getting. Or the amount of money that we're using here, and how do you want to tie into that? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm going to answer with how much it's worked me. Maybe that'll be a good indication. Uh, we had a couple of years there with a previous, um, a couple of years at two different times with a previous janitorial service that we did have okay service. And that meant that that account manager was talking to every principal just about every week or the building administrator of the week but they were only coming to see me about once a week and i even had times that i might forget to see them for a week and it may be two weeks but i didn't i was getting report cards in from the principals that were all very good i had very few concerns and that's back when we had the arena going on and there was a lot going on for me in the last most of the time over the last three years it's been every day okay it's been i have to put attention toward the janitorial contract every day every other day but i don't go a week at all that's there's nowhere near a week that i'm not you know because i have principals saying this is not happening i haven't heard from them that's not happening so forth so that's the best way for me to answer it is is it's requiring a tremendous amount more of attention for me 
the last few years than it ever has before. Is that? Yes. Uh, I really like the, what you said about hiring full-time people, because they, they really take, take, the, take responsibility for making sure that everything is in good shape, and they're making it make it easy for them. Yeah, you know, we had a question. How, uh, in my many years, uh, I, I, I don't know how many services we went, we went through, but one of the things that I felt did more good than anything, and that was meeting with either, I'm not sure it was a manager or a supervisor, every week. Uh -huh. And, of course, during the week when, when uh, she was <coughs> complaining, I, I, you know, I had a notebook. And then when the supervisor would come through, he and I would walk through the building, um, like on a Tuesday morning or, you know, whatever. And I felt like there was, that worked better than anything that, that was done the whole few years that I was the president. I have spoke with him whenever they first met. They said, what kind of things are you running into? And that was one of the main things is that management has to be talking to her. Nobody knows that building better than the principal. No one. And they know what's happening. They're hearing from their teachers, and they know what's going on, and they have to have that person meeting every week at least to know what's happening. Um, Cliff did it for the high school when he was there, for, and he did it for a long time. And by golly, they went into his office every week. They were they knew they had to. And but it made a difference. And they, they know they're they're being held accountable. So that's been a large part of the discussion. We're talking about a nighttime manager and a daytime manager. That that was actually supposed to be a requirement the last time we did. If you don't have somebody managing the people all the way around at nighttime and during the day and somebody talking to the principals, then you can't be providing the service our schools need. And but I also say principals have to make that a priority because mm -hmm. you know if I have a schedule for him to get off for him coming on Tuesday morning and you know all of a sudden all hell breaks loose or something, then you know we have to we've got to say I this is this is what I've got to do right now you know ten o'clock in the morning or whatever. And you remember y'all had a book in the, yeah. that's the other requirement. We had asked for a work order system and this thing, this go around what we're doing is we're requiring them use our work order system. So now when we get teachers, it'll go through the teachers to the same way that our maintenance department gets them. And then they will get a daily thing of the things if someone misses a classroom, they're gonna be notified of it. And that manager is gonna have to know that Instead of being in a book that can be overlooked or missed for a couple of days, they're going to get a daily work order sent to them on things that need to be done. And we discussed that, they understand that, and we're going to use our work order system to, so that we can monitor what's getting done in a timely basis. I, I want to comment on what Tom said. We've been through this a few times. Mm -hmm. So we can look through the retrospective scope and we can understand why some of it happened. But and I think that we've known Matt forever. He's always at the TSBA conferences. He's always around. He's steady. He does what he says he's going to do. And, um, you know, we even kind of cried when we lost your company. You know, we just stood there like, oh, we can't believe it. <laughs> um, but we're, we did all that in an effort to do better. And so I don't fault the board for its decision, but we were really hoping that the people did what they said they were going to do in the bids, that they took care of the schools the way they did. Um, so I think the city and all of this to me is Matt. Sorry, Matt, no pressure, but, you know, he's available and he's, he's always, he's been here a long time. He's been around a long time. He knows how these things work and he knows we're going to hold him accountable. He's very familiar with the President of the School Board and I think um, he knows that we know where to find him if we need to. Um, and I like that because Matt's done this job. He's not new at it. He's not cycling in, cycling out. All of a sudden, oh, you know, we got Matt to come and he represented the company, but now he's gone. You know, we don't have that happen. And so I feel real confident because you are here that this is going to be a good decision for us. I think you said on the phone the other day you've been with the company for 31 years. 31 years. So well, you can't retire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I will say, and, and this needs to be said, you know, the, the financial stake in this 
is higher than where we are right now. But uh, and Cindy can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, our our spending for janitorial services remained pretty stagnant for the last five six years. Um, we all know the cost of living has gone up, and things are more expensive now. And you know, quite frankly, I think you pay you get what you pay for. And in this kind of environment where we are right now, um, I, I don't. I think this is an investment that is good for our system. I think it's good for our families, our, our students, our employees. Um, and I, you know, I just feel I feel good that we will get our money's worth. Um, I'm always looking for ways we can spend more money on instructional things on employees, and we're going to look at that too when it comes budget time. This is not going to be the only increase that we will see if we, uh, we, you know, we. But this is something that we can we can move forward on and be good with. We do have um, ESSER money that we can use uh, as long as it's approved as ESSER funds, which are those federal dollars, can be used for janitorial services uh, while that federal money is coming in. So that's something that we can help to kind of mitigate this this expense that we're going to be seeing. You know, Cindy can speak to this more than I can probably, but. But that is something to think through. We do have some extra federal money coming in that built for this kind of contracting. Yeah, it's, it's under the position to offset some of the summer costs of 28 for the first couple of years to kind of ease into it if you're taking the, the state debt on the general fund the first yeah. couple of years. ESSER dollars have to be spent on COVID related things and activities, so this will fit that criteria. Well, that's a negotiation thing, but right now we have it as a fixed cost, and that you want so to there would be an opportunity for a, a, a cost of living increase in the deal. That's to help us keep up with rising wages, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we can cap that. We can work to cap that increase if if that's the pleasure of the board and whatever we negotiate. But, um, certainly, as costs go up, that's part of why you're in the situation you're in now. Is when you when you hold the cost of the contract level and the wage, excuse me, wages are rising, eventually that creeps up and, and kicks you in behind. Uh, just like you all, 80% of the expenses that you oversee, roughly 80%, is labor, and it's the same for us. And so, you know, a, a quarter an hour. 50 cents an hour, a dollar an hour tend to be significant as you compound them over time. Uh, I wanted to address something that Ms. Ingram said, which is communication. We would certainly love to have our management team have a, a standard meeting time each week, knowing that sometimes something's going to get in the way of that because you, as a principal, you're flying all over the building all the time. But we don't want, and you won't see it, that are managers only in the building at that time. So we want you to see them at some point every day. It may be just waving down the hall, but you'll know that we're there. <clears throat> Part of our, I hate these things. <laughs> Part of our uh, uh, startup procedure is going to be doing some education with the central office administrative team and certainly the building administrators on how APA, the APA standard works and what to expect with APA II. So when we walk together, you'll know what you're supposed to see. And if you have questions, we'll be able to point that out. So we'll have a good understanding and that makes our relationship more effective. So everybody's on the same page. Speaking of wages, we know there's a lot of discussion going on in different cities, different government groups about wages. If the minimum wage goes up to ten dollars there's going to be a major impact on a lot of businesses but if it almost doubles and goes to 15 that's really going to affect just about every company there is especially your food industry and and uh, some of the others that do well to pay minimum wage so everything's going to have to be readjusted at that point if by some chance it goes to 15 dollars which uh, uh, i just have real concerns about that I suspect there will be some sort of roll up, and every state's going to be different. But, um, you know, that, I'm, I, if I were a betting man, I'd put my money on minimum wage going up for sure. 
And that's just a side note. We're watching that very closely as well. The, uh, we, we've talked about a couple of things that we want to see in this contract. Just kind of, and one of which, when COVID hit, there was a huge reduction in workforce at the building. So there was, you know, last year from about this time last year on, we didn't have students in the building once they got them clean. And so what we seen was something we couldn't control. So there was actually, I'm going to call it profit taking that occurred. And we had nothing because we hadn't experienced the pandemic before. So we had nothing to be able to go back and argue anything with to negotiate that with. So we've talked and uh, one of the things in this contract, there will be a way to, in the event we were to have something hit like that again, that we will have a clause so that we can sit down and negotiate how the, how that affects us and how that change because if we go for three months and I think some of the aggravating part about that is we should have gotten our buildings back in immaculate and spotless condition and because of that break there that there there was more available should have been more available to make sure that everything was in so much better shape and frankly that's not what happened so um, I'm talking to them we said that we would have a clause where we talk if something a pandemic comes into play uh, we are so going to make sure that there are clauses which allow us to uh, to deal with situations in the event that things aren't getting done they're supposed to be that we have some repercussions with them to make sure that it's that there's a financial burden on them if, if we're not getting done so there's that's part of this would be part of this next discussion is making sure we have those clauses that give us OE some protection. Um, Tom, that would kind of play in that whole probation piece. At least we have something in the contract. We've learned this last year that we yeah. need to make sure we have stuff in there that helps protect us and ensure we get the service. We yeah, and, and one thing I, I want to say again for the public, you know, what we're talking about here, our floors weren't necessarily ready. Uh, carpet work, work, things like that. Now we brought in extra help to help with COVID-related cleaning, you know, fogging, those kind of things. So I don't want people to think that when we're talking about these kind of yeah. pieces, that the COVID part we're taking care of. We're talking about general cleaning, uh, waxing floors, and things such as that. We had the schools disinfected. Uh, make sure we're clear on that. We made sure the schools were disinfected, and that's the COVID pieces that you've got to make sure you're killing those germs and those. And we did make sure we, we bought the, the guns. We had those. We were doing our buses before COVID ever came along. So we, we made sure the schools were clean and that, the, that they, were, they were disinfected so that we didn't have to worry about contamination of germs. You're saying like if the kids were not there and they didn't have to clean the bathroom, they could use that time, that those employees to wax the floors and do some things that they had to buff the floors, wax to do that high dusting, make sure. Make sure that all the lights and vents are dusted well to get all those things that you don't normally have time to do every week so that when you get the building back, it's spotless. There's no dust. There's nothing under tables. That's the kind of thing. I'll give an example and then I'm ready to make a recommendation if you're more ready for that. But, uh, you know, one example that, that I can think of is we had a, a water, <laughs> we had a situation at the high school uh, about two months ago. Yeah. Um, where a mop bucket had been left to fill up, but no one turned off the faucet overnight and it flooded down there on the east wing. Well, how goes, because we thought maybe a pipe had burst, we didn't know what the situation was until we got there. We found out it was one of the pipes, just the faucet was left on from the cleaning uh, crew that evening. But at 7.30 ish that morning, there was one person from our current janitorial crew on site with. For that whole high school, for the whole one person. And that didn't set well with me at all, or how. And, uh, you know, that's a giant building that had one custodial person working that morning. Now, he was working hard, but that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that has really just come to my attention that we, in my opinion, it's time to make a change. And time to do something kind of different and go back, uh, look at our contract, and uh, 
can go a different direction. So that's that's my recommendation. If unless there's more discussion. Before you start, make sure I'm writing the numbers you had. Fifty two total is present contract, full time and part time. So they're all about but what you're talking about, Matt, 49 full time and nine part time, so 58 compared to 52. So actually, they're claiming 48 employees is what they have. Okay. One of their proposals was 48 employees. When you look at the hours, we need to do these two. And so we you know their numbers have not been there. So and it's equivalent hours, so 50 equivalent to 52 full time positions. And uh, so that's how we look at it. So, so you're talking more full time. Yes, sir. Yeah. Than that. Yeah, because presently we that I can figure we have maybe 20 full-time positions in our schools. Going back to one thing Dr. Dyer said earlier, and I really agree with that. And I know Dr. Dean was very strong on it too. You only get one time to make a first impression. You know, when, when people come in there and it's amazing when Hal and Brian built that arena, we've had teams from West Virginia and Florida and all over come in and they're just blown away. But how nice everything is. But you know, it, the building needs a little bit when you walk in. It's a band circuit common, so you get the plays in a little theater, whatever. The grass needs to be mowed. And I did the same thing Cliff did. It's very, very important to get that done. And I worked with them, I think, most of my time there. But anytime I had a call, somebody can remember Jerry last. Hey, Jerry, something needs to be cleaned or the bathrooms or, you know, whatever. You were very good to respond. And we expect that it is what works out going forward because the communication is outstanding, I thought. And that's a big part of partnership, correct? Yes. Uh, Dyer, do we have any employees in our school system that are custodial? No. no. Okay. Good enough. Anybody else have anything? My my recommendation would be to end the current contract we have at H with H E S at the end of the contract term and to uh, enter into uh, contract negotiations. Um, with SSC in order to bring the contract to the board, hopefully at our April meeting. And this would be through the TIPS. This would be through TIPS. That's yes. correct. The TIPS agreement. And of course, uh, I would, before I bring it to you, I'd take it to Chuck Gable and make sure that he signs off on it because he's our legal counsel. Yeah. Yeah. Need a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. We'll move that to the board agenda for Monday. Yeah, we are moving that. So welcome to stay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, items two through eight. Before we start, Hal's going to give you a little update on that. Uh, we will. What we'll do is we'll explain each item, and you can see each one can take time to vote on. So, since they're all facility improvements, if it's okay, we'll explain them all. And uh, Charlie, you know, we, we talked about voting at the end, and if that's okay, if you're acceptable to that. Yeah, that how the would be. And we'll, as we go, we'll explain each item. If you have questions on each one, we'll be glad to. Would also like to, unless this is already done, I don't think it is. I, I would like to see these prioritized because I think certain things might be a little bit more important than tile at one of the schools, mm -hmm. and, and we certainly need to address like the like kitchen equipment. Okay, we need to prioritize, in my opinion, the things that are most important and, and kind of put them on levels. Yeah. Or not. <laughs> well, you're going to find a lot of this is depending on the ether fund. Uh, no. and if they get it, if they get approved, I mean, I'll just give you the. If they get approved, mm -hmm. you all. One thing I'll say, but off, that's yeah. off of the rankings and sewer repair this summer. I just started on that. Sure. 
Uh, number two on your agenda is improvement of the crosswalk to CHS and Equestrian. So we're talking about the area basically from the baseball Jones building over to where the old first one used to be. Correct. That's great. Go ahead, Al. Thanks for letting us come before you today to, to discuss this crosswalk improvement plan. Uh, this is an area that is used a great deal on a daily basis by students that are coming to and from school in the mornings and afternoons. And like I said, this is every day. Um, it is used a great deal um, every day currently during the cold weather, but obviously as the weather gets warmer, we have a lot more students walking to school. And so the numbers can even double basically as we get into the warmer months. Uh, and so this is a recommendation that came to us from the safety committee at the high school, which is headed up by Dr. Garner. Um, and it also has been signed off on. I'm sorry, can you give me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Also has been signed off on by the administration at the high school as well. as kind of being a priority, something that they feel like is pretty important. So what they are looking for specifically is the current crosswalk that is there. We want to make it more visible and, and make it more stand out more to motorists as they're coming by so that it can be more of a safe environment for kids to cross the road. Um, so we took that information and we've done some research, uh, looked into different vendors that provide equipment you know, that we would need there, looked at different equipment to see what might fit well with what we want to do, looked at signage and that sort of thing. Uh, so we did that for quite a, you know, a couple of weeks and so forth to check into that information. And what we found was Lee University has something, has a model of really what we want to do there uh, that would fit well with, with what our needs were at the high school. So um, at the corner of Okoe Street and Billy Graham Avenue, I think it is, uh, they have installed a crosswalk system that is what's called a RRFP. Uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacon system. Very unusual, but it's, it's uh, anyway, it seems to be a very uh, efficient system. It seems to work very well. I talked to some of the staff members over at the, the university, and they've been very happy with it. Um, this was actually a project that they did, that we did with, uh, in association with the city and with the state because of Highway 11 coming through the right there. Um, and they've been very happy with it. So we got a lot of information from them. Uh, we've talked to Cleveland Utilities. We've also talked to city engineers and so forth, Tommy Myers, um, to kind of research the situation. They've been out to the site. Um, they've talked to us about what they think would work best and so forth. So in order for us to, to do this, we, again, we would mimic basically kind of what Lee University has in place. Ours would be more of a basic version though. That was a pretty, pretty expensive, uh, program or project for them, we would do basically the same thing, but it wouldn't be quite as advanced or complex as what they have in place. There, the difference would be that with our system, the student would push a button in order for the flashing lights to come on and, and, and indicate to the motorists that come on crossing crosswalk there. At Lee, they have bullets which have the sensors in them, and automatically as a student approaches, uh, those sensors go off and the lights start flashing automatically. Uh, that's a little more expensive than what we would do, we put in place. Uh, but still, we would accomplish the same thing just by activating the system of pushing the button. Uh, so, the big question is how much does that cost? Well, we looked at several different companies, got several quotes, and we are looking at about $10,500 to $12,000 uh, in order to purchase the equipment and have the installation uh, by different companies uh, put in for us. Um, the good thing that Thing we have to about is that um, all the funds have already been secured basically for this. We aren't asking for any additional money uh, through our safety grant that we have uh, that's been awarded to the city school. We will uh, take a certain portion of that money in order to cover the cost of, of the system and having it installed. And, so forth. and again, we feel like we've covered our bases pretty well because we've worked with the city, uh, we've had their engineers involved, and we've had the utilities involved. And so we've tried to bring everybody to the table to see really what would work best uh, in that particular location. Um, any questions in regards to? I'm sorry. No, this is not the. That, this is through a, a different program, our regular state grant program. We've also applied for a grant that I'll talk to you about with the trust. I do think that's a good model to follow because Lee has tried over the last 50 years plus 
has tried everything to get that crosswalk safe. And this is probably the best thing. But I'm really surprised they haven't built one of those things like they have a UT to go over the street, you know, uh, the traffic. But this one is very effective, the one they have with all the lights and all of that. Where is the crosswalk that you're referring to? You know the the Jones the Jones building the rest of the building the baseball field is in Cliff and I've talked and, and it needs to be repainted too. But right it goes almost right across where the old Fort Tennessee was. So we have a lot of wellness classes. When it's better weather, they'll go there and walk the Greenway and it's used quite a bit. Actually, it could be used in the in the evening during the ball game. You know, when we got the ball game and something like that. Not going on about that. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say it's the very same thing. At night, they have ball games and it's dark, you know, and, get, and people are parked across the street. You know, that'll really increase the safety. Yeah. And that helps with our established parent responsibilities, though. We have kids that are coming and walking down there now. Mm -hmm. I'm using the greenway to get to school, and sometimes they'll come up that way by the bank. I'm really surprised the number of parents that are parking over there. In the uh, that Green Ray Pavilion driveway, mm -hmm. I mean, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon, that that is full, and the, you, so the kids are running over there and getting in Mama's car and leaving. I know there's no way you can stop that, but I'm really surprised. It used to be at the uh, Perrysville Church, you know, they were using it a whole lot. It seemed they put a bar up over there now, so they migrated somewhere else. But uh, there. It's such a hazard. I hate going down Razor Drive between two and three o'clock in the afternoon because you've got the cars and driveways, you've got the kids, and they're crossing everywhere along that road, not just at the crosswalk. And it's so dangerous. And I, I think this is a great idea because anything we can do to get those students to use that crosswalk would be great. We can also talk, you know, if I look at it up there at Razor Drive and Peerless. In front of the church cars crossing, but there's a button at each pole. Mm -hmm. And down the road, we might even have to look at at the north end of the campus in front of Wesley there. We, we have a lot of kids to go across there. That's not right now, but this would really help that make sure the kids are safe. But I we we weren't neither one for sure about up there Paris and Raider, but there's four poles right there and there's a button in each corner. So we're, we're good there, but down the road. Any other school too, where we can do to make sure the kids are safe. Any other questions? All right. Let's go to number three there. Replacing the, the hallway tile at Stewart, Hal Taylor, and Brian Templeton. And Brian, reduce your air control. Okay, air knock off candy tree. That's what I thought. He's very involved in that project, so he's helping me all the You do most of Nate with Nate here when I'm not that Nate, Nate. Yeah, but all right. Well, it, this goes back to something we talked about earlier in the year. Uh, Brian and them have done the research, check stuff. So I'm going to let him tell you about what we found and what we're going to have to look at doing for this particular project. And then I'll talk to you about afterwards and where these estimated costs come from and so forth. Okay. So at Stewart Elementary, uh, we've been there a couple times. We've been to the line on GeoServe. Been assisting Scotty and Hal before we got involved, and um, uh, I guess the issue originated in the conference room that um, there were there was a carpet tile that had encapsulated existing asbestos-containing uh, tile in mastic, and so um, there was evidence of moisture issues there on the other side of the the carpet tile, and when it was investigated further, found out that, you know, that was kind of a, it just kind of snowballed. So, um, there's the, and I guess the, the tile primarily in the corridors, um, I do recall that that was discussed back when we were involved with the science plan, so I think it dates back in you know, several years, but there's, Telegraphing of the joints from the asbestos tile through the new encapsulate or the new PCC that was put down roughly yeah. plus years ago. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, in talking with um, uh, tile companies, some vendors, um, the, and we did a moisture test. The moisture test revealed that 
at the time, we only had isolated areas where moisture was high, kind of around drinking fountains, areas where you typically would see that sort of thing. But um, it appears that the mastic that was used with the new BCC is reacting with the old asbestos containing material, which is creating, you know, it's it, it's a deterioration. It's like you can see the, the new tile breaking down. So the proposal in, in talking with geo services, which is, you know, they're an asbestos um, specialist. So the proposal is to take all of it up essentially to get to the root, to get to the bare slab, and uh, to remove the mastic, to remove the asbestos containing tile, the new tile, you know, get, up, get all of it essentially clean, and then put down a, uh, we're unsure, uh, back in that, that vintage um, of construction, uh, the technology for vapor barriers, which would go below the slab, is not as advanced as it is today, so moisture tends to be a problem in, in those areas. Um, I don't want to go too far in depth, but you know, asbestos products had, were actually very strong and durable. You know, they had negatives, but they did hold up well better to moisture. So what you're seeing <coughs> is that that's not the problem, it's the new stuff. So um, the scope that we're proposing after looking at it and walking with Al Scotty is pretty much treating the, the uh, corridor areas. So we take all that up, we put a, an epoxy product down to, to act as a vapor barrier over the slab, and then put the VCC down. Uh, and then also uh, go into the area where the problem was originated, where, you know, where we had the moisture issue and take all that up as well. So corridors um, and the conference room, you know, that little cluster of space and there. Um, the um, you know, project could take place this summer. We've done the field measuring and identified the scope. Um, Geoservices has done their work as far as specifying what has to happen for the abatement. Um, so if the board elects to move forward, uh, we could put the project out to bid in March and have contractor ready to begin immediately as soon as school's out. You talk about the safety of the building today. Well, yeah, to make sure everybody knows that it is safe. Right. There, the Geo the Services has actually done the testing, and they have provided some information to to how and through their evaluation that there is no hazard in its current setting, um, and it's more of a, a long term. You know, eventually, I think that's just going to continue. It has gotten worse, and talking to Ms. Shelton, she said that, you know, the, the deterioration of the tile has gotten worse over the period of time that she's been there. So, Ron, does this have anything to do with the, the building being on concrete and being low and having water issues all around it? I think that it originated, well, it was, we looked at it uh, last winter, you know, lots of rain. When we did the moisture test, it was a little later. We were expecting, you know, we were expecting higher moisture levels, so I think some of that may have subsided. But I think that and the fact that there's no vapor barrier, it, it could be a problematic. So that's why... You know, if you go to this effort to do this, I think it's a good investment to go ahead and put the, the you know, surface applied moisture product down so you protect your investment. I was going to get into the years for summer at our elementary school. Are we going to have summer programs? Stewart will not be one of the school houses. We're going to have three of the elementary schools that's currently in use this summer. And we'll Consolidate some of that, but Stuart would not be on the list due to construction. And that gives you a whole summer. Right, right. Just kind of okay. You know, because of the abatement, you know, that takes a period of time to, to go through that process. So, I mean, it, it's doable over a two month period, but I think it'll take it to do that. It didn't know it's Right. Yes, 
Two hundred thousand is what we estimate. That we actually said it was going to be somewhere between one hundred fifty and two hundred. And as Brian looked at it, that's somewhere where it is. So we're we're calling uh, you know as high as two hundred thousand once we take bids on to see. So if uh, this project is delayed, there won't be any health hazard with the delay, right? No, no. So it's safe for how many years? If the, if the decision is not to do anything, how, how much time do we have? Well, let me let me back up there. We we have to do something with the conference room area because right now it can't be used at all. So that's it's, out. so that's that's completely used out. out and can't be used until we do something with it. We've had to just close the door and log in because that's going to require abatement. And if we do abatement a little at a time, the cost is, is just skyrocketing. So, uh, so there is an aspect of this that we do lose some use of the facility. Is this a summary? No. Everything was done correctly. Mm -hmm. Tom, to your point, um, Stuart, when those buildings were built, they're still safe, they're still good, they were built on clay. Now you remove the clay. And that, anytime we have a drought, it affects, we do get cracked, we have building settlement, it's a little different. And we have to look at our own, and any old building, you're going to have that. So that's just part of having older buildings. But that, I do think you're exactly right, that has contributed to where a new building, you're not going to have that. Uh, foundation under it is not going to be on clay, it's going to be on something solid uh, that drains per se. And a new building would have um, a higher level of vapor barrier that would keep that water from getting in, into the floor slab and, and the draining, breaking the heat and the wood. And the, the tile itself, if you see what it's doing, we can't find anybody that can tell us they've actually seen this before. Mm -hmm. So I think we have, we, we might have some time. I can't say though that we have five years, 10 years, and I don't know that Brian can say that because nobody can tell us, we can't find anybody who's actually seen the title doing this. We know it's still intact, so for right now we know we're safe. Yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. not saying not do it. I'm just wanting to, uh, I guess, communicate the urgency and knowing that the conference room is down, that's in of itself, that's a problem. Well, the, the estimated cost is up to two two hundred thousand dollars. We do have Cindy and Hal work together on this. Uh, county bond funds, so the money from the Pi Center funds, could be you know associated with this to to knock this project out. So um, we're ready to roll that as a as board of group, and that's a well that'll be part of the recommendation when we get to the end. Uh, number four. Clay from the kitchen hoods at Ross, Yates, Arnold, CHS, Stuart Powell, Brian Gunther, and Gina Reed. As we enter this, we'll, we'll, the, all of the rest of these will have an S <coughs> and mostly be what we'll be talking about ESSER funds. So part of the qualification with ESSER funds is that they have to have something to do with ventilation or sanitary. Uh, so that's when we get into the ESSER funds piece, that's why these projects specifically are being addressed. Let me interrupt you that. If I ask Hal, we weren't sure, but ESSER is Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. That's your initials there. Yeah, I didn't know what money. Some people call yeah. it CARES money, but it is the ESSER. ESSER is what you'll hear us say over and over again. So that's, so when we've selected these, even though we may have some different ones in our facilities plan, these actually qualify and we feel like we can get all these approved so that's why we're and, and we had to give the estimates for all the rest of these we had to give the estimates up front to the state so we may have some differences we think that the final pricing down at the bottom we'll get to will still be somewhere we think everything will come in around that amount but they did want initial estimates up front that, that 
Dr. Barnes has had to provide in the paperwork to the state. And so that's why, um, with, as we talk about this, you know, when we get bids, they may vary, but we do think they come in close. So that being said about the ESSER fund, um, the uh, kitchen hoods at Ross, Yates, Arnold, DHS and Stewart are all issues we don't have makeup air for. And so we're actually pulling air from the interior of the building. Anywhere it can come. Cracks, windows, when a door opens, it comes through the building and it gets pulled across whatever's there into the kitchen and across the food as it's being prepped and it pipes it out. Now, that's the way it used to be done, uh, but now we have fire codes that have changed. We need to update this for the fire codes as well as the sanitary and ventilation conditions. COVID has opened up whole new things about do you want to bring in air from your dining room where students are sitting and run across. So, so that's why we're looking at this as a project we need to do now, especially with this funding. It's a ventilation thing to get fresh air into the building or at least keep from, from pulling air from places that shouldn't. Uh, in our food prep areas. Uh, any of these other items extra eligible with number five, number six, would they be on the extra eligible? Almost everything we're talking about for the remaining here is going to be extra funding. Yeah. And that's why they were selected. Now, this one's a little different because, uh, and, and I'm going to I'll hand over to the minute to, to Brian, but Gina Reed has also done some work on this one, so I'm going to let her explain what she's done and to help out on the funding piece of this this one, and she can explain it better than I can. Um, well, I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm, this is uh, sorry, this is all next one. We'll get to the dishwasher. Still on kitchen hoods. I have learned more about kitchen hoods. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I jumped again. So, so Brian, well, I'll tell you, Brian has been telling you about this. So we. Um, we, we took a tour of all the facilities and that we're looking at here with um, our mechanical and electrical engineers last week. And um, we were basically just identifying um, the, the, you know, the current status of the hood, whether we had power, whether we had makeup air sizes, you know, whether we had power, whether we had gas, all those types of things. Um, and of the of the um, schools that, that have this, this issue, Arnold is the oldest, obviously. The hood is in much need of replacement. <laughs> it, it's very old, and, and I don't know that it truly, you know, I know it doesn't function like it should. So um, in looking at that facility, um, it's a multi-story building, and the duct from the hood to the exhaust is required by code to be stainless steel because you've got grease and, and stuff and it can, you know, it can create a plastic situation. So it's not. Um, and that was the first issue that we identified. So um, what our engineers will continue to look at, we're going to have to get them back down there with a hood fender. But what we'd like to do there is to try to find a way to go through the wall and not have to retrace all the way back up to the roof because that could be very costly to have to replace that duct. So we're trying to find another way to get fresh air into the into the space and to be able to do the exhaustion properly. So um, you know that one probably is as the the, the highest cost of all these. The high school is, you know, you're serving more population, so it's twice the size of all the other hoods. So it's going to be a little larger scale, but I think it's, you know, it's easy to get into. It's, we've got plenty of ceiling, you know, uh, above, uh, you know, from the ceiling, to plenty of space between the ceiling and the structure to get everything connected back. Um, we did, we looked at um, Ross and Yates, and both of those hoods um, were compliant as far as, as far as having the infrastructure to provide the makeup air. We're having issues with one had a makeup air unit, and there was an electrical issue. The other, we think, doesn't have the unit, and we, miss, we, we may just need to provide the, the makeup air unit to keep the hood intact. 
So there may not be as much work involved in those two. Um, and then sewer, um, you know, it, it wasn't as very complicated. The issue there is that the roof structure is a little different. It's the old, it's a tectum, which was like an acoustical product and bowl feed. So we're going to have to put a makeup area unit on that. We can't, it, the roof can't support it as is. So we'll have to do a little bit of structural work there to, to support the new makeup area unit. But, um, you know, the next step for these projects is um, to get our engineer hired to have them come back and start to sort out the details. We've got the initial round of information um, and you know, this, this work really needs to take place this summer so that we don't impact um, the school opening in the fall. There are lead times that we're going to need to sort through that, communicate it back to Hal and, and Gina just to know where, where we are there. Um, but we're working and we will work and push this forward to, to try to make the most of the summer period. Um, my, my initial schedule is to try to get this thing out to bid end of March. You know, we'll try to do better than that, but there's a lot of people involved. And this, of, the, of, the, of, of all the projects, this one's probably the most complicated. So we'll try to get it out to bid in March so that we can have a contractor on board in April to be able to you know, take advantage of summer break. Question? Yeah, uh, Charlotte. Uh, how do we have a contract or anything with a hood cleaning company to come into our schools periodically and clean these hoods? We do at first school service. We have them cleaned every year. Once a year. Yes. Yes. Every summer they have to clean them. Well, I know we're not near on the uh, scale that Jenkins Deli is, but we certainly don't need one of those issues in our schools. Um, you know, of course, they're so much more into pride and all of that kind of stuff, which is a lot more grease going up. But the hood cleaning is certainly necessary. Mm -hmm. I would like to add just a side note um, because of the question was asked previously about the schools that are helping summer programs. I'm working with um, the program that's going to be feeding the YMCA that's going to be the elementary school. This will not affect any of those schools because that food is going to come or be prepared at the middle school. Thank you. Okay. okay, if you look on the sheet, Dr. Dyer in this case, Replacing dishwashers at Ross, CHS, and Arnold, and also some on the regular agenda up there. The soil table at CMS. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's my omission. Right, in there, so. right. right. So you're free again. All right, so well, I'll let Gina talk about what she's done to help out with this one, and uh, then we can. Well, as you can see, there's a huge undertaking at these locations, and um, the facilities pieces, obviously, these, these large pieces of equipment are being attached to the buildings and they're not cheap. Um, so USDA offered the opportunity for equipment grant funds. So I put in for an equipment grant for Arnold for their dishwasher uh, with the amount of work, especially, that has to be done at that school. And the kitchen was not remodeled when the rest, the rest of the school was. And I had I had heard mention of that several times. And so I took the opportunity with Dr. Dyer's approval to go ahead and put in for those grants. And we were awarded $52,000 to put toward that dish room um, and that dish machine in that school. And I've been talking with Brian. I sent him the information yesterday. Uh, some of you may know uh, procurement for school nutrition is just a little bit different than what um, the school systems procurement regulations are. So I've sent him that information and am very willing to work with him uh, on that bid process and let them go through uh, because the board has approved using them um, uh, up one design on these projects that are going on. So we'll do everything we can to work with them and make sure that all the regulations are adhered to. Can we purchase any of this equipment through the tips or through the you know, state? We're, that's one of the things we'll be looking at and see what we can do and, and can't do. They, they, part of the ESSER funding is that 
that we try and, you know, typically everybody pushes you towards bidding all the time. In this case, the ESSER funds are asking you to use, like the TIPS program and these other purchasing programs where they've already gone through the state. So we're actually, in some of these, as we get to them, uh, we're going to be talking about how we are going to try to use uh, contracted services through the state funding because that's that's the requirement or a request of taking the ESSER funds. Yeah, it speeds up the process. It speeds yeah. up the process. Yeah. We can cut that bidding period out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Kids in Tennessee. Interlocal. I have to read it every time. I think it's it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a local the inter purchasing system, right? Yeah. The. Yeah. Okay. Well, my understanding of that, you said that they're critical and for not purchasing locally, is that any vendor that wants to be a part of that can and submit bids to the state. And so, if a local, if a Bradley County or a Hamilton County or any county vendor, they might win it. I want it for the whole state. Somebody over in Edward County might purchase from them, right. and they so it benefits the local people too. But you still they have to bid. Right? They have to have bids. Yeah, and some of like the larger vendors, and then you have smaller vendors that are local. That's contractors for them, and it kind of all so it doesn't cut out. So in and we're talking about ESSER funds from here out, so a couple of things you need to know. We have deadlines, and one of the things that came up, and I think Peggy, you mentioned about having school. It, this is going to be a challenge, and it's something that we've talked to Brian about, and all of his planning is going to have to try to work around, uh, because we're being asked by the state, and, and we're being told, here's funding to fix all these facilities pieces, but stay in school all summer too. So, so this summer is going to be a very, uh, to be honest, it's going to be a challenging summer. Dr. Dyer, uh, you want to talk about what, the, were you talking about the principals? Yeah, no, I had, when I had Marshall principal and I warned them, you know, I, you know, I said, we basically are going to be all up in your areas um, during these summer months. And it's just going to be something we have to just agree that we're going to be real close together trying to get schools. You know, the schools are going to be in use for summer school, summer learning. We're going to be doing that. But at the same time, there will be construction projects potentially going on in the kitchen area. And, and I know we all know this, but I'm going to say this for those who may be watching. When we're talking about dishwashers, we're not talking about what you have at home. We're talking about restaurant style, industrial style of dishwasher systems, which take up basically the whole roof. Um, this is a big, big project. So uh, this is not just, you know, plug and play like you might have at your home. So yeah, we have talked to principals about this, and they do understand we're under a time crunch. You have to use your ESSER dollars, and the projects have to be completed by a certain time. So your render, everybody who uses dollars like this, which everybody, every school system will be, we're under a time crunch. Yeah, we have trouble finding the people to come to do the work. Hope not. <laughs> we might have to use Mitchell screwdriver and come all over. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what is the soil table? Okay. The soil table, well, actually, I'm going to let the expert answer that, but you want to know the better. Is the soil table? Yeah. Is the table where the dirty dishes are loaded in front of the dishwasher before they're managed? Yeah, we know. Now we know. The middle school has a carousel, exactly. and the carousel has become very warm and used, and uh, they don't recommend any longer. They don't recommend putting those in middle schools and high schools. There's some safety concerns. So we just need to take it out and rework that area at the middle school. Well, I'm going to ask you a second question. Gina, at this point with COVID and all this, are we using disposable things or are you have the schools gone back to regular trays and silverware? So we are in the process of a little bit of a transition because if there are students that are eating in the cafeteria area, and not taking meals back to classroom. We are beginning to use a few of those trays, but that's very few and far between at this point. We're still using most of the special. That's what I thought. So. Yeah, so let's, let's talk a little bit about Arnold again. Um, it, it, it's the oldest facility, so if we're going to replace the dishwasher, one of the things that we noticed when we made our visit was that the floor is beyond, I mean, it needs to be replaced as part of this. 
that piece of equipment comes out, it's the time to do it. So we would recommend that. And then there were some sewer modifications that have been made above slab. So when you replace the floor, it gives you the opportunity to go ahead and do what shrinking you need to, to make that fix as well. So we would we would recommend addressing those two items. Is that included in the cost is there? No, it would be in a, I don't think. It's not included in the 50,000. No, not in the 50,000. Well, we're, we got a total cost for all of the dishwashers here. Uh, and that would be, the total estimate was 327,000 for all of the work done with replacing the dishwasher. And it would be included in that. And then, uh, the other facilities that were finished, the plumbing, all that was in good, good condition. So it was just Arnold that needed a little additional work. And the lot opened up. Anybody else? All right. Number six, replacement of fresh air units and live power. Um, one of the things that we, we weren't able to do with the ESG project and not been able to take care of is there's two large fresh air units on Blythe Power. Um, we have fresh air coming through anyway into the school, but these take care of the older section of the school. Uh, and we really need these in place, especially when you start talking about fresh air for COVID. Um, and so this falls exactly right under the, the ESSER funds. And it is something that's on our long range plan, or excuse me, our five year capital plan. It's in, listed in there. This is an opportunity. It's a very large expense that you don't get to see a tremendous, you on a daily basis don't see the benefit. The kids feel it because they get fresh air brought in. Uh, however, uh, like I said, being a large expense, we felt that this fell, fell right in the ESSER funds, what they're shooting for. And this was the time to take care of this. These are big enough units. They're 40 to 50 ton units each. They have to be put on and taken off by a helicopter. So these are something that also need to be done. Um, however, we set them, the days that we set them will have to be days that there is nobody in the building. Uh, and as knowing that, we're going to have to work around schedules. Uh, so this will actually be one of those projects that takes a while because we'll have to work it around uh, being able to set the equipment. Uh, but but this falls right into the ESSER funds, and this also is a benefit to our students. Well, it, no, that what they do is they bring in keep fresh air in the building. Um, the older schools that didn't have fresh air intake, and, and we actually the ESG program, we added pressure effects. So by two o'clock in the afternoon, the kids would be falling asleep, and so would the teachers. And it's because they weren't getting fresh air, they didn't have the same amount, and, and it's called stale air. Well, all our schools have fresh air now, but these units, um, just for whatever reason, these units have not held up well. They've been an issue. Uh, servicing, servicing them hasn't really been a big issue, and they're beyond repair, they're obsolete at this time. So now, they wouldn't fall into the priority list in a normal circumstance necessarily, but because with COVID, they actually fall top of the list mm -hmm. uh, because these are fresh air coming in and allow us to provide more fresh air to our students. And they actually cool and heat that fresh air. They don't just bring the fresh air in, they bring it in condition. Yes. Now, why can these units not be placed on the ground beside the building and vented into the building like we do our they're heat so, pump? They're so large. Yeah, that'd be a, another reason to set them on the ground beside the building. Yeah, well, you could always, one, the school's already, it's already built that way. So to do that would take so much ventilation, and then you would also be talking about tremendous increase in fans. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, the cost of moving them would be very prohibitive. Um, we're kind of already set up to have to put them there because all the ductwork is in the school. It's all covered. So it would be hard to do that without having a very large, um, large expense to that. Uh, the number one problem is the units got put in in a way that they can't be serviced well. And so that's really what one of the, and we have made that a condition. And Brian knows that he's going to make that a condition of the bid. You know, everything has to be serviced. They have to be serviceable. Um, and so that's, that's one of the keys moving forward to make sure we don't get equipment put in that we can't fix. 
So these are custom units. Um, you know, this probably wouldn't be able to happen during summer, so we have to look at maybe the Christmas break or you know, some period of time when we know for sure we have the unit available and you know be able to tell the contractor you have this window to get the work done. We we make sure that it's students wouldn't be on campus so that it doesn't create a safety issue. And these do fall under the government contract piece <laughs> because we purchased our equipment direct for Candy's Creek to save money. If you remember, we purchased them through a, a, a government contract with a train. And these would also fall under that. So we'll be looking at purchasing them and possibly even looking at the labor through the government contract. What are the ages of the, the current units? They are from 19, I think it was 90, 99 when that building was redone. They were put in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, these are obsolete. And um, like I said, the, one of the biggest problems is just the way they were put in. You can't actually access them to service them. Well, I have a question. How long is it, you know, you gotta take them off the roof with a helicopter? Put the ones up and stop. How long does it take? You know, I think it's something that you could probably accomplish in a, in a week's period of time if you're having everything there. Can we look at maybe fall break instead of the center wouldn't do this for the kids yeah, today. Yeah, we'll look we'll look, at, we'll look to see if we can have all the ducks in a row to be able to take that. And we know I would, you know, do the center better for the kids than. And you've got a better chance to have a better weather fall break than you do the credit. You've got the power there, you've got, you yeah. know, utilities, you know, they're just going to adapt the curve that it sits on if it's a new unit. And, and the ductwork doesn't really change. So um, it's mainly from on the roof. The, the way the weather goes, usually fall break better than Christmas break. So that's a possibility of fall break. And the biggest thing is that you've got that helicopter over the building for one day. Yeah. You know, that generally speaking, it's only done for one. One day for the kids to do. Yes, sir. You, um, you said these were all custom. Um, how much time would it going to take to replace it? They, if we, once we give the okay on um, some of the units that I talked to train about, if you don't want to answer this one, he was talking about August before he could actually have them built. And that was if I okayed it about three weeks ago. So, yeah, that's the problem. is, is yeah, that's uh, what we get into. Yeah. And do these have probably a 10 year warranty? They're commercial. They'll probably have like a one year on the actual unit and 10 year on the compressors. We don't like one year. We like 10 years. Yes, I know. <laughs> we can always ask. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, that's what we can ask them. We can ask them because we are specking the equipment. So we can ask if it's available. And while we had Candy Creek Candy Service. You know. Oh, by golly, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This goes back to making sure somebody's um, for ESG. Scotty was at every unit put in, mm -hmm. and if we didn't see that we could get put in a way to service it, we, we made sure that that got noted and got fixed. So that's the best way for me to answer. So the same thing at the arena, same thing at Candy's Creek. Because we know we have to fix them for the next 50 years, so so that's the uh, one of the main things we do is making sure everything that gets put in now is serviced. Anybody else? Uh, number seven: replacement of the classroom carpet and glide bower, and the court in the house in very bad shape down there. The carpet. The uh, the, the carpet at, down there. We, we did a project like this about eight years ago at Frost. Uh, the carpet down there is in is in rough condition, uh, and what we would like to do is replace it with tile throughout um, in all those classrooms and get that something we can take care of from a sanitary standpoint. Again, this falls under the ESSER fund because it is a sanitary piece. Uh, we don't think that we can do anything to get that carpet any cleaner or in better shape than it is, and also the tile is is safer. It's it's not going to hold stuff. You can't you can't wash carpet every day. So we think that right now this would be good to do approach with the ESSER fund. You mentioned the uh, bids about the office and yeah, the we would we would the classrooms are where the worst condition is. We would go ahead and do alternate bids on this to make sure we can cover it with the funding. Um, 
but do alternate for the office area and the theater as well. Um, all of that carpet again is from 1999, so it's had a good bit of wear. And uh, but the classrooms are really the the biggest concern. You've got a tile where they use them. The tile they're making now looks like wood. You know, it's really attractive and quiet too. Uh, is that what you're thinking of? No, ma'am. We would stay with what we've been using, which is the VCT, because we know we can it'll last a long time and we can take care of it. Luxury vinyl tile is what you're talking about. Luxury vinyl tile. Yeah, it's a little more yeah, expensive. Yeah. Well, you know, you're looking at replacing that carpet and getting the instant damages. That's 94 or something like that. Um, I'm, I would actually have to look at our list. I don't I don't know that I have that on. I think I have it on the on the capital plan, but I don't think we put a date to it yet. So we would need to look at it. There is. Probably in the near future, effort 3.0 that's coming. And a big push from that, from what we're hearing, is more of these type of projects. So, this is ESSER 2.0 <laughs> money, but there's a chance we may see up to double what we've received so far um, for more projects like this and instructional things too. But um, so that could be an option for another time to get you to your work. What, what is the typical lifespan for a carpet in a commercial setting like a classroom? Uh, I'm going to ask you. You're, you're probably into that. I would say probably 15 to 20 years is that how long that probably building is. I mean, you know, a lot of it depends on you know the you know the, the atmosphere, the environment that it's in. Um, and now when we do replace carpet, we replace it with the carpet tile so that soiled and worn pieces can be replaced easily and it's easier to maintain. In new construction, we see kind of across the board, most, most school systems steer away from carpet just because of these reasons, because of sanitary cleaning and you know, longevity all the time. Um, you know, like any tree. It would be very similar to other school systems and their new facilities. You're really only seeing carpet in the admin area and in the library. The general population, classrooms, um, group education areas are BCC. The other thing about, about this project, um, we're aware that Flight would be one of the schools, Flight Tower would be one of the schools where the students would be present. They're going to be there for summer school. So part of this project would be planning and being able to create a, a visual um, for the contractor as to what he can do, what he, or he can do, and when they can do it, what they have to have done before they can. They don't, don't get the whole building. So there's a sequence to be able to, to do this sort of thing. And it would involve maybe putting up some temporary walls and just some partition wall kind of like we did with the arena to isolate the areas of construction um, from where the school activity is going to be and, and that sort of thing just so that we, we've got you know, secure barriers the students can, can, can get out of the building in, in case of an emergency that sort of thing. Uh, number eight. Replacement of 30 tons HVAC unit and the comments on the, at the high school because now it gets a lot of complaints. It's really cold in there sometimes. And this will help with uh, the, the hood's actually going to help with that. The, the high school hood actually pulls air through the building. So here you have an air conditioning providing cool air straight into the area right outside of the cafeteria. But then, then when that hood's running, it's pulling it straight right out and throwing it right back out. So the hood. Is going to help out with the HVAC in the common, but also the unit itself is it's 20 years old. It's it's at the it's at the end of its useful life. Typically, we would see something like this last another 10 years, maybe uh, in a commercial setting. But this unit's had a lot of wear, and we have some frames that that hold the. We have some repair work that would be very expensive to make, and given this situation that come about with it. That we are probably looking at needing to go ahead and replace this now, um, instead of instead of waiting on this one. It's it's like I said, we have some frames that hold the coils that are rotting out, and deteriorating, 
that are going to require a tremendous amount of work to put into a very old piece of equipment. So with the ESSER funds being available, that brings this one to a, a situation that probably should be replaced at this point. Um, knowing that we have had issues with heating specifically in the columns here. This is an exciting money to spend. You know, this is the kind of thing that we would get a great amount of money, and, and this is uh, we're not used to getting ESSA funds or anything like that. And we spend it on things to make our buildings nice and safe and healthy for us, to the staff. Um, and it, it's the kind of thing that People don't walk through the building and say, oh, you've got a new 30 pound unit on the phone, you know. <laughs> but the overall atmosphere of, of a place to work for our staff, a place to go for our students and the parents, it, it, it's just such a blessing to have the money to spend like this. And I think that, um, I'm, how I just can't thank you enough for identifying these things until, you know, not waiting until the, the 30 pound unit falls onto the roof or all those things. I mean, you're just so blessed to have you too. And thank you for bringing us. We don't like to hear any of this, but uh, it has to be done as long as we own buildings. It's always going to have to be done. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if you ever sleep. Uh, I mean, you've got transportation, you have uh, facilities. Uh, I, you know, know you are... I sincerely love what I do. Um, I have the support from you as a board. I have Dr. Dyer that is a great support. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm a very fortunate and blessed man that I do what I like and I get to go home at the end of every day knowing that that hopefully I've done something good. So I bet you sleep well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess. Uh, yeah. Carol, he called me one day, he was on vacation. I said, really? Are you kidding me? He said, no, I am. So I don't think I'm down the road where you're yeah. at. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I said, you need to take my vacation. I was thinking of the phone. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of phone. He's calling you on vacation. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you need to enjoy vacation, you know, and everything. But and I said, well, I just think like the I mean, we appreciate what you do. And he said, Charlie, as long as y'all have me, I want to be here. And I said, as long as this board is, she's. We like what you do, man. And Brian has always come down and you guys from up one of those things. It's a, it's a good situation. Uh, you note at the bottom there, some things are, uh, of course, you know about the sewer repair, baseball scoreboard, how things will be 18th of March. Uh, we're meeting a track resurfacing guy Friday at 2. What about the interior painting of Bay Hill? Those are just things that y'all you had already approved. Yeah, that's not on the summer day. Yeah, it's it's uh, we didn't put it on the agenda because it's stuff you've already approved. We were just making you aware of. So. Yeah, the canopies, though, we're going to do those. The canopies, so they're already working on the canopies. So that'll be another project that gets done at the same time. Um, uh, so we'll be doing that. Uh, and Mayfield is slated to get, so we'll have to work that out. We may have to do a work that out the parts, but the branding's been very patient. Um, with us on that, and we know it's time that we get him handling those hallways and common area things as well. So, and then you take comments that they've done their study yet on the system. Yeah, they're, they're working on it. They're working on that. We're going to be down on Friday. Yeah, we're gathering information, trying to get all the ducks in a row. I think there'll be some meetings in March to, uh, to kind of discuss. Any other questions or comments? I have one last question for Dr. Dyer. Um, I'm not familiar with ESSER and, and I haven't read you know, enough about it or whatever. Is this a loan or is this a, a, a grant where we are not paying it back or is yeah. it a 10-year loan or something? ESSER is federal money that's coming for COVID relief. So this is no payback. It's a, not really a grant. It's just new federal money coming in. Uh, based on right now, that's for one and two, based on a number of economically disadvantaged students that we have in the school system. And that's the easiest way to say that. Now, 3.0 is looking like it's going to be approved in the near future, which is going to be even more money for a lot of different things, but including education. 
So there's potential it could be split uh, either by economically disadvantaged when it has been, or it may come out in a different form. But either way, it looks like there will be more funds coming to the state, which has been dispersed by. So we do not have to pay back escrow money. We do not have to apply for any grant for this. If the money automatically comes in, now it has to be approved, and they have to understand that, you know, like we've all said, whatever we're spending on has to be traced back to some sort of COVID reasoning. Um, but they're giving a lot of leeway with that thus far. And, How long does that take us, guys, for that approval? It's fairly quick. I know for the next round, we have March 15th as a deadline to approve. Right. And we don't know how long it'll take for the approval back. It's going to be fairly fast because they're really encouraging people to submit before March 15th because the state has a very quick turnaround to approve it because the federal government is making them have a quick turnaround. So um, I think it'll be fairly fast. Well, it's a blessing that we have this money, and I think we're using it very wisely. Dr. Dyer and how are y'all going to recommend we move forward with these, all these facility improvements that was listed on the agenda and get them listed Monday? That's my recommendation. Second. Motion on that. Dave? Second. 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 Everybody good? You want to do it? We'll do this on the agenda Monday and get some of these things done. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Well, I'm going to have to die one or two. I told you to get this done in there.